thank you everyone for joining uh, this evening's talk. Um, I've invited Dr. Stuart Greenhill from the University of Aston. Um, he's a senior lecturer there. And he did his PhD at the University of Bath and he did conducted postdoctoral research at Cardiff University. Currently, he's researching synaptic plasticity in a range of different diseases at Aston University. Um, I'd like to hand over to you, Dr. Stuart Greenall. No worries. Um, do you want to go through the rules of the chat, Abby? You said you wanted to give a bit of a, a yes, pricey about um, what we're going to do. So if we could keep our mics and cameras turned off throughout the meeting, that would be great. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll go through them at, in the Q&A session at the end of the talk. Sounds good. Right, this is where I'm going to reveal my age because I'm going to attempt to share my screen on, on Google Meet, which is uh, always fun. Okay, have you got the recording going, Abby? Yes, sir. Cool. Let's do it. Okay, can you see my, my slides? Yes, sir. Excellent. All right, so I'd really like to thank you, um, one, for inviting me here to, to give a talk, because it's a real privilege to be able to share um, what I do with, with a wide audience, and especially with an audience of, of people who are the next generation of whatever you want to be. I'm not saying you must be a neuroscientist, but there'll be plenty of people who want to be medics or dentists or lawyers or engineers or something like that in the audience. And I think that having, a, having an enthusiasm for science, having an enthusiasm for the curiosity that we've got to foster in order to be able to, to solve big problems is a really important and uh, a really an admirable thing to have. So I genuinely really like to thank you for being here. I'm quite excited to be able to, to present this stuff to you. And as Abby's titled it quite correctly, we're going to talk about the evolving world of neuroscience. Neuroscience is a relatively young discipline. You, you couldn't really do neuroscience um, up until very recently. It's not something that was a discipline in and of itself. I didn't do neuroscience at university, as, as we're about to find out. Um, but it is something that's becoming more and more prominent. And it's one of the, the things that people are kind of interested in you know people, people it's, it's, you get it in the news you get elon musk with his magical um neuralink system to try and fix people who have had accidents or, or what have you and so it's it's something that's becoming more and more visible in the pantheon of, of science and it's a really nice discipline um to be in it's not an easy problem to solve as we'll see um but it is something that is constantly challenging you and something that is such a big nutty problem that it's a big broad discipline there's lots of people who are neuroscientists who don't do anything related to what their their colleagues do you know we're all trying to come at this in in different ways and we'll go through that too so here's us here's our you know campus in the middle of birmingham i don't know if you've ever been to aston um but it's got a nice green oasis right next to the uh, Aston Expressway. And this is pretty much the, the view from where we sit and looking out across the thing. Obviously, it's quite dark just now. It's not, it doesn't look like this. Uh, but this is, you know, a, a hub, really, of quite interesting neuroscience research here at Aston. And I'm, I'm privileged to be a part of it. My first journey into science was that I... Um, decided at the very, very last minute not to be a medic. Um, I, I really, really wanted to go to medical school for a very long time. Um, and I decided quite late on that I didn't, I loved the science of it. And I loved the idea of, of solving problems, but that the, uh, the people side of it may be a bit challenging for me to be perfectly honest. So I decided to go into to pure science to, to, to scientific research. And so I started out doing pharmacology, and I don't know if you've come across pharmacology, but it's the science of how drugs and chemicals affect the receptors and systems in our body. And I did that at Edinburgh for uh, four years, and then went on to do a PhD, as Abby says, in, in Bath, in neuroscience and neuropharmacology. So we were interested in figuring out how the brain works, 
and figuring out how it goes wrong in certain conditions and coming up with new drugs to try and intervene in those conditions. And that's really hard. You know, developing drugs costs a lot of money um, for drugs companies. And we uh, have to kind of meet them halfway. So we have to come up with ideas for new drugs. We come up with which receptors are involved in what process, what kind of chemicals we would want to put on those receptors to change their function in certain conditions. And it's still a really nuggety um, issue. Like it's very, very difficult to have that first kind of idea of what targets to throw these chemicals at. And the fun part about biology is that the brain and the body reuse lots of the plans and proteins and things like that within um, different systems. So you'll have a protein that, that circulates around your blood, for example. We'll come to this in, uh, a bit later and talk. A protein that circulates around your blood that does one thing for your immune system, but there's a whole other thing for your brain because the brain lives, of course, inside the central nervous system, inside the meninges, and is isolated almost completely from the wider part of your body. So it's a, it's a very kind of weird and cloistered system that can reuse all these different proteins. And so you have to be quite careful. If we take the example, um, if you have Parkinson's, uh, one of the best pharmacological treatments for Parkinson's, if, if you know, you probably do know that Parkinson's is a, a loss of dopamine in the part of the brain that helps to control our fine motor movements. And one of the best ways of helping people with Parkinson's is to replace their dopamine with uh, something called L-DOPA, which circulates around your body and then goes into your blood-brain barrier and gets changed into dopamine by the brain. The trouble with that is that taking L-DOPA on its own makes you feel really ill. The body, per se, doesn't like a bunch of dopamine circulating around it. It makes you feel sick, nauseated. It's no good. So what you do is you take L-DOPA and you take uh, something called the dopa decarboxylase inhibitor that stops the wider body from converting that L-DOPA into dopamine. But the dopa decarboxylase inhibitor doesn't go through the blood-brain barrier. So once the L-DOPA goes across into your brain, it can fix itself into dopamine and everything's fine. The analogy um, that we can draw and the, diff you know, the, the sort of fun, finer points of pharmacology in general are things like um, leperamide. Leperamide is what you take if you have um, a runny tummy. So um, what's it called? Imodium is largely made of leperamide. And leperamide is actually an opioid, like uh, heroin, for example, but it won't go into your brain. So it can't give you any of the, the, the sort of addictive properties or the, the psychogenic properties that opioids can give you it just circulates around the wider part of your body and it stops you going to the loo because that's one of the things that opioids do they attach themselves to opioid receptors in the gut and they slow down your gut's trans um, transport so it's a big old nugget you think it's a big old complicated system that we're trying to figure out bit by bit protein by protein and cell by cell and these are our brilliant beautiful complicated brains so if we think about the, the major achievements of people, of humankind, you can think about something like the Large Hadron Collider, sitting down there under the ground in Switzerland, smashing particles against each other with great abandon. And that takes 120 megawatts of power to make it work, to fire these little hadrons around the circle and smash them into each other. That's a lot of power. You know, that's you know, a small power station, necessarily. And it does a single function. All that power, all that energy to do a single thing. If we move across and look at the space shuttle, for example, the space shuttle now retired, is often um, cited as the most complex machine that people have ever made. And in the space shuttle, there are two and a half million moving parts. And that sounds like a lot. Until you think about our brains, our brain contains something in the order of 80 or 90 billion neurons, even a relatively standard brain in a truculent Scotsman 
contains 80 plus billion neurons. That's a lot of neurons. And all the stuff that does, all that calculation, all the carrying around of every memory you've ever had, all the way that you can navigate from your house to school and back again, all that information that you need to know to get through your A-levels, to do all this kind of stuff, that takes as much as a 20-watt old-school, very dim light bulb. That's all your brain uses. It's the most remarkably efficient thing. And our bodies, humans, have evolved effectively to be marvelous transport and effector machines for our brains. We are special only because our brains are so good. We can't run very fast. We can't see very far. We can't shin up trees or hibernate or do anything special. But we have got these enormous, powerful calculating machines in our heads. And that is why we can sit in rooms full of shelves and textbooks and communicate with each other because we've evolved these marvelous brains. It is also, if you think about it, the first object known to give itself a name, your vacuum cleaner, your toaster, your sofa, your whatever, your, your dog, your cat, doesn't give itself, as far as we're aware, a name. But our brains have. We've evolved to the point where we can communicate with each other and pass on information from generation to generation. And really, that is the, the crux of humanity, the ability to talk from one person to another, down and down through the ages, so that we don't have to rock up and figure out how fire works or anything like that. We don't have to constantly learn and watch people because animals, you know, animals are marvelous for passing on innate behavior to each other, but they can't write it down. So even if you've never met a biochemist or, or a doctor or a rocket scientist, you can start to understand what they understand by reading the stuff that they've written down in their textbooks. And that's a huge thing. That is a unique property of anything that we've ever come across. And so figuring out how that works, figuring out how our brains manage to store all this information and manage to process it and communicate it is one of the biggest challenges that we've got as scientists, that we've got as humans. And as you know, as, as I cod philosophized back in my dorm room at university, if our brains were simple enough to understand, would we be smart enough to understand them? And it makes you feel very, you know, uh, philosophical and everybody looks at you and goes, mm, that's interesting, that's interesting. But I mean, it's true. The, the, are we ever going to be able to solve the problem of our brains? And the answer could be yes, but we'll need help. And we'll look into what we can do to pick apart the activity of our brains as we go. So if you think about how the brain communicates with itself, as opposed to how we communicate with each other using our brains, it's all about waves and what we call emergent activity. Say you took a bunch of marbles, for example, and swirled them around a great big bucket they do all sorts of semi-random stuff. They bump into each other. They might form little patterns, little waves. And we call that emergent activity. It's, it's a complicated mass of stuff that's all doing things of its own accord that eventually work together to make something that's greater than the sum of its parts. And we see that in what is um, quite correctly called brain waves. So our brain works by the constant little chattering of, of tiny protein channels which pass ions through them. And those fluxes of ions are integrated by the soma in our neurons. And then so the neuron decides whether to fire or not and pass on some neurotransmitter to the next neuron and so on and so on and so on. And if you think about it, much like you get computers that have effectively enormous processors that are made simply of transistors and NOR gates and AND gates and all the little logic gates that you can make out of transistors. If you wire your brain cells together in a particular way, you can get much more complex stuff than that neuron on its own will do. I mean, not to besmirch the peripheral nervous system, but if you think about my hand, I've got mechanoreceptors in my finger 
and they will respond to touch and that touch will be transduced into a signal that will work its way up my sensory neuron into my spinal cord and up into my brain and it goes hey ho something is touching it that's very impressive but it's very very simple what am i going to do with that information and it's the extra bits of our brain that are involved in figuring out what it's going to do with that information if we look at the brain of a of a rabbit for example this is a model of a rabbit's brain it's all very smooth and simple this little nugget at the front is the olfactory bulb much of the rabbit's brain is given over to its sense of smell and you can see that it's cortex is very very smooth it's very very simple and it doesn't have a lot of connections between it and the same is true of say a rat's brain or anything like that our brains have much more complicated connections between them and that allows us not just to have bits of our brain that are interested in what's happening in your sensory system or your eyes or your ears but takes that information and what we call associates it with each other but in order to do that it's got to coordinate information so I want you to think about, say, the Commonwealth Games or the Olympic Games. You watch the athletics and we've got somebody doing, um, I don't know, the, the, the high jump or the javelin. You take uh, Katrina Johnson-Thompson, you know, she's going to do her high jump in, in, in her uh, decathlon. And when she starts, everybody goes like this in the crowd and they all clap slowly all together. And as she runs up, they clap faster and faster and faster. And then she does the jump and does it well. And everybody goes like this, marvellous. The next time that happens, the next time you're watching the telly, think about how difficult it is to synchronise fast things over long distances. It's almost impossible. So what the brain does is it takes slow waves that it can generate across disparate areas and uses that, like I say here, like a radio in reverse, to shape the faster oscillations that little local clusters of neurons are making. And it's that little local cluster of fast oscillations that lets us think. So this is how different disparate parts of the brain talk to each other and influence each other effectively by amplitude modulation, like an old school radio. The big slow waves shape the size and the activity of the little local waves. So we can take the information that comes in from our sensory I'm back. That was a, a brief interlude. Can you, uh, let me try and share my screen again. Okay, are we back? Everybody can see? Splendid, thank you. Um, right, anyway. Um, we can move on from this. So this is, yeah, this is how the disparate parts of our brain talk to each other. This is how our sensory systems are integrated with our memories, with our past experiences. And this is how we navigate our way through the world by this, this modulation of waves upon waves upon waves. So as many people ask me, Stu, what do you do all day? What does a neuroscience act, neuroscientist actually do? <clears throat> and the first thing we've got to clear up is that neuroscience and psychology, for example, are different disciplines um, a psychologist is marvelously interested in the absolutely upper level of, of how a brain works, how we behave, how we think, how we feel, how we talk to each other. Um, and that's great. But we have to think of the difference, for example, between understanding wh what a car does and understanding how an engine works. So as a neuroscientist, I'm interested in the cylinders and the valves and the oil and the chains and the belts and the battery that comprise... Um, the brain. So I want to get into the nuts and bolts of it. I'm, I, I'm obviously very interested in the end result of that, which is what psychologists study. 
But what I want to do is get in there and understand how individual cells talk to each other, how those individual molecules within those individual cells work and propagate information. So you can pick your poison, really. You can pick the interesting level for you in something like neuroscience. This is true for a lot of biological sciences. Whether you want to work at the molecular level and understand how a single channel works and opens and closes to pass ions through it, whether you want to understand how our neuron in and of itself works, or like me, if you want to understand how a bunch of neurons work together to make more complicated pieces of activity and change the, um, the weightings, if you like, the, the influence that they have on each other into how we learn things and how we understand the world. In order to do that, we have to go about it quite carefully. We have to understand how a neuron works, and we have to understand the difference between what a neuron can do, because we can make them do tricks, and what a neuron does do. And so oftentimes we will make these quite delicate recordings from individual neurons or from groups of neurons, and listen, if you like, to their electrical activity. Listen to the little clatter-clatter of the channels that are opening and closing in this membrane and passing these ions backwards and forwards. Because that ultimately is the fundamental currency of thought. And the more we can understand that, the more we can extrapolate it and put it into computer simulations and all kinds of stuff in order to figure out how we work and how it goes wrong in certain conditions and how it changes how we age. You know, there's a whole different discipline of neuroscience looking at development and looking at aging. And one of the things that I, I, I do quite a lot of the time is create the next generation of neuroscientists, trying to pass on what I know and the passion that I have and the experimental techniques that I've learned and helped develop to the next generation, to people that you know are younger and more energetic than I am and have a different take on things. What we're interested in is trying, people bringing us, or students, for example, bringing us aspects of the thinking that we hadn't thought about before. What we want is for people to question things, to try and take new angles on um, the problems that we've been wrestling with for years and bring a set of fresh eyes to it. So it's really good to bring through PhD students and undergraduates and people like that who can challenge you and ask the questions that you haven't actually thought of because that's part of the joy of it. You, the humans and scientific discovery in and of itself is an emergent system, is a chaos of complex individual parts working together to make something bigger than the sum of itself. And so, as I say, you can pick your level. And it's a very broad discipline. If you went out there and said you were a policeman or a doctor, you'd very quickly get into trouble because you would be arrested for impersonating a, a police officer or a doctor um, because it's a protected title. But anybody can be a neuroscientist. Depending, as long as you're doing something to research the function of the brain, you can call yourself a neuroscientist, really. And we can do it in a, a really tight molecular biological level, all the way up to whole organisms and populations. Um, and there's a whole branch of extra disciplines that are um, appearing all over the place in neuro law and neuro marketing and um, so population neuroscience, if you like, that takes it to the next level of, of the societal level. So it's it's whatever you whatever you fancy, whatever floats your boat is is what part of neuroscience you can research, and it all adds together to try and solve this problem of how the brain works. So what we have to do for, at the beginning is pick, as I say here, a sensible question. If we understand what we can do and understand what we can change, that's part of the part. Um, of setting up a good, repeatable, reliable scientific experiment. And so if we want to understand the, the function of a particular receptor or how a computational model of a single neuron works, that's grand. That's a very noble um, way to go. If you rocked in and said, you know, I want to cure X, X condition or I want to cure, you know, all of dementia by Tuesday, it's not going to work. I mean, you might try, give it a good go, but it's unlikely to bear any fruit we have to start chipping little bits of rock off the mountain. We have to understand that we will never just be able to individually, or even as large groups, pick this mountain up and move it. You have to realize that what you can do is contribute your little bit to this part of this enormous whole of, of research that is trying to figure out this almost impossible problem.
So what I do <clears throat> is something called cellular electrophys, um, electrophysiology. And so just out there, it's all gone dark because the lights have switched themselves off, but just literally just out there. And if we get to the end and we've still got time, I can pick my laptop up and show you a tour of the lab. There are a bunch of machines, a bunch of uh, amplifiers and little tiny robot arms and enormous, very expensive microscopes. And what we do is we get slices of brain and we visualize the neurons in that slice of brain. And we take little tiny glass needles that have little holes in the end that we make ourselves on a, on a little machine that pulls them to a specific size. We fill those little glass needles with a salty chemically solution that mimics in the ways that we want to the inside of a brain cell. And with our little robot arms, we take the needles and we touch them on top of uh, the, the usually the, the body of a neuron, the soma of a neuron. And that little glass needle is connected to a tube. And this is where it gets weird, right? This is where you're down the pub or at the dinner party or whatever, and you're trying to explain what you do. And people start looking at you as if a small eye is starting to grow at the top of your head. What we do is we put a tube in our mouth and suck it. And that gives a little bit of suction that opens up the membrane of the neuron, which creates a contiguous connection between the inside of the brain cell and all the amplifiers and jazzy bits of kit that we've connected to this little needle that's attached to our little robot arm. Ultimately, what that means is that we can intimately and very carefully record the low down currents, the low down activity of that neuron. So we listen to all the ions, all the signals that are coming in from all this massive dendritic arbor that's connected to the soma. And we figure out what that neuron's doing, how it's going wrong, how it's talking to other neurons. We stick drugs on it. We genetically modify it or fill it full of jazzy uh, dyes and other kind of reporters. And little by little, day by day, cell by cell, we figure out how neurons talk to each other. And then how groups of neurons talk to each other. And then how those groups of neurons go wrong in conditions like epilepsy, schizophrenia, all those kinds of uh, conditions that we're interested in figuring out. And so that's what I do all day. And we've got this phalanx of people, you know, PhD students and graduate students and postdocs and research associates that do all this work for us. And, and working together with my colleagues and the other people in the department, we figure out how we can contribute, what we can do to understand better how our brains work, which is fun and weird. If we have enough of this information, we can start to feed it into models. And so it's always great fun. You have this experimental data and you take it and you take somebody clever with an enormous, very scary looking computer. And you go, hello, Miss or Mrs. Parson with an enormous and very scary looking computer. Can you make a model of this neuron or how these neurons talk to each other? And you go, yes, yes, I can, of course I can. And he or she comes back to you and says, well, this is what we think. And you go, well, that's interesting. Um, and you can feed it back into neurons. So you can take all this sort of experimental data that these models make, these supercomputer type things make, and using the little needles that we looked at before, you can inject it as a current into the, the neurons and make them do things and figure out that if you were missing this channel or you had a different kind of resting membrane potential or a different response to X or Y input, that's what happens when you've got epilepsy or whatever. And it adds, if we treat that as an iterative process and go round and round from the experiment to the model, from the experiment to model, that's how we start to chip away at the notion of, of, of brain function and neuronal function. What is becoming more and more prevalent is organoids. And so um, what we see is that people are growing brains or brain-like objects out of uh, stem cells. And so you can trick, for example, people's skin cells into going back to being stem cells. And then you can make those stem cells back into neurons. And you kind of let them have at it. And with the sort of careful chemical signals that you can apply, um, that means that you can build a sort of miniature brain. And as long as you treat that carefully, as long as you just don't go, oh, that's entirely how a brain works, and treat the data that that's uh, making sensitively, 
you can trick that little organoid, that little bit of brain, into recapitulating certain phenomena, whether it wants to be your center for memory, whether it wants to be a brain that has a particular disorder or a particular developmental difference. That's one of the ways we can make models of conditions that we can do, again, this kind of uh, cellular electrophysiology or whatever kind of uh, output you want to do on it. And again, chip that little bit of rock off of the mountain, understand a little bit more how things work. So we take it from a developmental aspect as well. Because, and this is a photo I took a couple of years ago now, um, it has now been joined by even more phenomenally large buildings. This is right in the middle of town near Moore Street Station. Building a brain is very much the same as building an enormously large building. You get a, a, a sort of central tube up the middle. And then that central tube forms the axis and the symmetry and the backbone, if you like, of the structure. And then you start to add floors and windows and, and sofas and whatever else you want to add to it. And your brain, our brains, are constructed exactly the same. As I showed Abby earlier that this is, this is a model of uh, a lamprey larva, which is about as simple a brain as you could come across, in, in, unless you were like a worm or something like that. But you can see it, it comprises a tube. Our brains are made of tubes. Our, everyone's brain starts off as, as what we call a neural tube. And depending on how complicated it gets, it will start to create these little outcrops and patterns and things like that and start to fold in on itself and specialize and yada, yada, yada. But ultimately, it starts off as a nice little tube of folded um, cells that start when we're very, very small, when we're very sort of early embryonic stage. And that can go wrong, that can go different, that can do all kinds of stuff. And so one of the, the really hard bits of figuring out how our brain works is figuring out how it's built. And you can imagine uh, a system where we've set up a whole bunch of chemical gradients. And of course, if you've got little bits of cells that are spitting out chemicals, um, if you're very far away from them, they're very uh, diffuse, they're, they're low concentration. And if you're close to them, they're very strong. And so depending on how far away or close you are to these um, signaling systems will depend on what happens to you. And this is how our brains are made. And so figuring out how that goes awry is another level of complexity to the problem. And so this is how the neural tube, for example, folds. And it's very clever. And this is on the, on the left-hand side. You can see a bunch of electron micrographs on how a mouse's neural tube closes up in the, in the parts of the development. And we can see in the middle here that there's uh, different signaling molecules, sonic hedgehog homolog, bone morphogenic protein, noggin. They've all got very amusing names for some reason. Um, and depending on how far away you are from them, your neural tube will either close in a one -er or it'll have a little hinge on it. Because obviously, as the tube gets bigger or smaller, it's easier or harder to fold it together. And that process continues throughout the proliferation and the building of our brains. And so what happens is we eventually get to the point where we've built all the sort of inside of our brain, if you like. And then the bits that we're interested in, the cortex and all that, forms itself from the inside out, believe it or not. In the same way that your eye is kind of backwards, your brain builds itself from the inside out, which is a curious way of going about it, but it seems to work for us. What that means is we get little scaffolds of these glial cells. Glial cells are the helper cells of the brain. You've got loads and loads of glial cells, microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, your schwann cells that myelinate your peripheral um, nervous system. They're all the kind of pit crew, if you like, the, the, the things that we can't do without, that we, that we depend upon to keep our neurons healthy and happy. And like Spider-Man, they, they shoot little webs up to the top of where the brain is going to be, and the, the brain cells kind of climb up them like that based again on this gradient of signaling molecules. If that goes wrong, we can see different um, arrangements of the brain cells that aren't really what we're after. So normally your cortex, your, your sort of outside your brain, is arranged nicely into five or six layers, depending on where you are. If that goes awry, if that signaling goes awry, we can end up with sort of tuberous sclerosis or what we call focal cortical dysplasia. And that's where your, your brain cells are slightly jumbled up. And of course, because they're slightly jumbled up, it's a bit like um, connecting up your, your train set or your USB port a little bit wrong. You'll get interesting results sometimes. 
And what we see is that some people with uh, FCD develop epileptic seizures um, because the, the brain is just sort of slightly differently wired and they can be very, very focal. And so as I was saying before uh, the talk started, what we can do is with the permission of the, the folk um, who are undergoing the surgery, if you've got uh, epilepsy that can't be treated by drugs, you can get the surgeons to cut out that little bit of your brain, presuming it's suitable to be cut out. Sometimes you can't because it controls, you know, your vision or your, uh, your left hand or what have you. But we take that tissue with the permission of everybody involved. Um, and we do what I said before, we, we, we slice it up into slices and we use our little tiny glass needles to listen to the inside of those cells. Not only that, but we can keep those slices alive for quite a long time using something called organotypic culture and keep it in an incubator and treat it with drugs over weeks and weeks and weeks um, and, and use that to develop new treatments for, for example, epilepsy. Um, these kinds of epilepsy, the drugs really oftentimes won't work. There are only so many anti-epileptic drugs in the world, there's only so much, so much that the, the, the neurologists and co can use. And these kind of focal dysplasias can lead to what we call intractable drug refractory epilepsy. So it's really important that we understand more about it so that we can help the drug companies develop new treatments. In order to find that, then people uh, in the hospital, neurophysiologists, neurosurgeons, neurologists will do these stereo electroencephalogram, stereo EEG um, electrodes, and, and find out in the deep parts of the brain where, for example, this this focal dysplasia is coming from, or if a lot of epilepsies are down in the sort of hippocampus and internal cortex, which is difficult to record from on an EEG. And so it's a whole heap of very clever and very specialised people that localise this epilepsy, and that's where you know we can get this tissue from. The surgeons will cut out the very very specific part of the brain that is generating these epileptic seizures. And it's a real privilege to be able to take that tissue and poke our uh, electrodes at it and try and understand why these cells are talking to each other differently uh, than, than other cells in the brain. And that, you know, as I say, leads us on to understanding how the receptors work, maybe the profile of the receptors that the different brain cells are expressing is different. And we can send that to our chums at the various drug companies that we work with and they can start on the road to developing new treatments. And so what we also do is use our little needles to fill the brain cells with dye and other such clever things. So we can not just record from their um, electrical activity, but they, we can fill them with stuff so that we can look at their morphology. And one of the things that we're interested in is on the very first sort of bits of your dendrites and stuff, you've got these dendritic spines and you've got these little, little lumps that um, effectively are synapses. And some conditions on some sort of brain cells, as we go through life, as we change the way that we, our brain cells all wire up to each other, they will change the size and shape and number of those dendritic spines. So you literally fill these brains full of dye and then put them on your jazzy microscope and stick them on your computer and you count one, two, three, four, five, these spines over a certain distance. And by doing that, you can figure out how um, intimate, how strong the connections are between a couple of brain cells. Do that, for example, in a mouse or a rat that has um, got a dye, you know, genetically, for example, added to its brain cells, and you can stick a sort of laser microscope that can see through the skull or see through a little window in the skull. And you can count those spines as they disappear and, and appear based on development, based on learning, based on all kinds of stuff. And so it's, it really is watching these little bits of information that are uh, effectively encapsulated by tiny little blebs on the side of your neurons, appearing and disappearing and coming and going, um, which tells us how these connections change. And all this leads to um, new treatments. This is a paper that we brought a couple of years ago um, with the, the whole team at the, the children's hospital and all the people that work with them that is looking to change the way that we think about how epilepsy is treated. And so 
we are actually looking at using a new way of um, inhibiting one of the really uh, important receptors in your brain to treat this difficult kind of epilepsy. And so the, all this stuff, all these black squiggly lines is the sum total of the electrical activity that we're recording from a whole bunch of these uh, brain cells. Um, and this is from the, some of the human brain tissue, some of the, the surgical tissue that we get across, it. my PhD student and my colleagues that did uh, all the work on it. And so we can look at these little, you know, um, perturbations in the electrical activity as little miniature epileptic seizures in a dish. Um, and if we can wash the drugs on and they all disappear, then happy days, we've come up with a new idea of how to treat epilepsy. And it's not just for epilepsy. This is some work that I did with my colleagues uh, a while ago um, that is looking at modifying plasticity by, if you remember, using one of the molecules that your body uses for something else. So this is looking into the activity of something called CCR5. Now, CCR5 is a kind of immune receptor. It's found, you know, all over your body. It's on your white blood cells. And one of the things that it's notorious for is that if you've got a HIV virus, one of the ways the HIV virus gets in to your blood cells is via this CCR5 receptor. So the whole panoply of drugs um, used to try and stop people from uh, having their HIV turn into AIDS, for example, and keeping their viral load nice and low and keeping it out of the blood cells. It turns out that your brain cells, your neurons, express that very same receptor, but they don't use it for so much of the immune um, response. They seem to use it to modify their plasticity. So if we take the, uh, the drug or we take the receptor out of uh, the brain cell, you get much, much more plastic. You can change the connections. You can <coughs> change the, the speed at which your brains um, learn stuff really, really quickly. And this is a fascinating little thing. No one, no one thought that this receptor had anything to do with plasticity before, but we proved that it was part of the neuron and we, we, we showed that it modulate, modulates plasticity. And so this is another little nugget. This is something that we can start to go, hey, we've discovered this. Let's build a whole bunch of research on top of it. And eventually, hopefully, we'll end up with a treatment for, I don't know, stroke recovery, for example. The uh, Alcino and his, his group have gone on to, to use it for stroke recovery, for treating various different kinds of dementias, perhaps, or for, for trying to sort of protect our brains after um, TBI, traumatic brain injury, or something like that. It's these little random, exciting discoveries that lead to this entire panoply of uh, extra research and extra kind of journey to the clinic, if you like. One of the ways we can figure that out is by giving um, haircuts to rodents, which sounds weird. So mice and rats, for example, their primary sensory modality, um, or one of the primary sensory modalities, is their whiskers. They live underground, they've evolved to live in, in your skirting board or in a burrow somewhere. And their eyes aren't very good, their ears are okay, their, their, their sense of smell is pretty good. But the way they work their way around the world is by whisking things. They use their whiskers to feel their way around the world. And their whiskers are connected to their brain in a very, very defined pattern. Whereas, in fact, if you take the, the brain of a, of a rat, which I've got somewhere, here we are. If you take the brain of a rat, like a massive dose of it, a huge bit of that brain, is dedicated to the sensory input from its whiskers. And if you take a, a slide and you dye the brain in a particular uh, way, you can actually see the pattern of the whiskers recapitulated on the top of the brain, which is weird. What that means is that experimenters can take your, your mouse or your rat and it can, they can just give them a haircut, cut off most of the whiskers apart from one. And that means that over time, the bits of brain that were dedicated to the other whiskers will stop listening for those whiskers and take over, uh, be taken over rather, by the whisker that's left. And if you think about it, that's a kind of very controllable way of uh, recapitulating what happens if we were, for example, to lose a limb. You know, if, if you lose a limb or if you lose some kind of part of your body, generally the bit of brain 
that's been controlling that part of your body will be taken over by the bits next to it and you you'll start to be able to do other things or the reverse is also true if the bit of brain that controls our arm is damaged sometimes the neighboring bits of brain can take over and if, with with a lot of rehabilitation and clever people helping you you can get that function back so by giving um rats and mice haircuts we can understand how people rehabilitate from injury and all that kind of stuff and again it comes down to counting these little lebby um dendritic spines these these little tiny white dots are are what we call dendritic spines those those synapses that i spoke of before and by making a combination of that and histology and understanding how the cells are shaped and how they respond electrophysiologically and doing all this haircut and doing some genetic cleverness we can start to understand how conditions like schizophrenia bipolar disorder various developmental conditions arise in the building of these brains and so the future, as Abby's talk uh, said, neuroscience is evolving really, really quickly. And new techniques are being uh, developed every day. And the, the sort of cutting edge is in getting more and better data. So this is really dense recording electrodes. We can print electrodes with nanotechnology. We can print electrodes in the same way you can print a, um, a chip for your computer with photolithography. We can keep slices of brain alive for longer in organotypic culture or build brains of our own with uh, organoids. We can, we can take the chunks of human tissue and use them to, to properly get an understanding of how the human brain works. We can use laser microscopes and fill them with special fluorescent dyes and do clever things with lasers to build these beautiful three-dimensional images inside the brain without having to take it and slice it up and do all kinds of sort of destructive stuff in it. We can just look at it. And the real breakthrough in neuroscience over the last 10 years or so is something called optogenetics. And I don't know if you've ever come across optogenetics. You know what um, an al algae are, right? An alga is uh, sort of a plant that can swim effectively. And it wants to be at the top of the water in order to photosynthesize. So it has a sort of rudimentary protein in it that can sense light. And it will follow the light and try and get up as, as far up in the water as it can in order to be able to get as much sun as it can to photosynthesize. And that's all very random and whatever. But some people took that protein and packaged it in a virus. So that means that we can express that protein in brain cells. And by expressing that protein, because it responds to light, and because it's an ion channel, we can turn brain cells on and off with lasers which is, you know, very kind of evil uh, secret layer kind of stuff. But what it means is that we can map out exactly how these brain cells are talking to each other. We can intervene, make a sort of pacemaker for your brain. Some people are working on so that if you had, for example, an epileptic seizure, your um, system would understand that and, and stop it. And all kinds of extra mapping that we can do by basically stealing the way that these algae find their way to the top of the water and implanting it in a brain cell. So literally, we can suck the inside of a brain cell out and listen to its electrical activity while turning it on and off with a laser. And that, in a nutshell, is modern neuroscience. Um, it's hard. There's lots of stuff going on every day. It's a really, really difficult thing, as I've, I've tried to sort of impress from the beginning, but we do what we can, and it's really exciting to be a part of it. Um, what I would say very quickly, because obviously we're coming to the top of the hour, is what you could do if you were a neuroscientist. This is me, this is uh, my fiance, and she's a clinical neurophysiologist, so she works across the road and does all that kind of work up that I've talked about in terms of trying to find out how people's uh, epilepsy is working and all kinds of extra stuff like that. And this is me, this is the lab out there, and I get to do what I've just said. So we work together effectively to bring the research to the clinic. And in order to be able to do that, we've got to be able to work with all these kind of companies and a lot of our graduates and our friends have gone off to work with, with the, well, much more than this, but other various kind of companies that do things from everything from artificial intelligence to drug discovery. Um, this is a picture of a rig in my lab. It's just one of the more simpler rigs. And this is a picture of our undergraduate lab. So upstairs here at Aston, we have got this very research grade setup where you can come and make recordings of real bits of brain if you come and do our neuroscience course. And so we're really proud to be able to do that. We're really proud to be able to throw this research grade um, kit 
at the uh, at the undergraduate level. So you can come and you know poke brains with us if, if you're so desirous. And this is just a quick kind of precy of, of what you could do if, if, if you were to come and do neuroscience as a degree. Um, you know, the, the, the days are over where you train to do one thing and that's what you do for the rest of your life. What, what you can do as a neuroscientist is understand data, understand critical thinking and really kind of um, throw yourself at any kind of problem that you, that you feel capable of throwing yourself at. So it's a really good place to start your way off in life. Abby, I'm going to hand over to you because I'm done now. It's seven o'clock. Um, and if you want to take us through the upcoming talks that you've got on your, your marvellous series. Okay. Thank you very much. That was an amazing talk. It's extremely interesting to listen to. Um, so I just wanted to advertise the upcoming BSSN talks for the future. So we have one a month. Um, as you can see, on in February, we have an aerospace engineering talk. In March, we have statistics and machine learning. April, um, construction engineering, and May, artificial intelligence. So these are all on our website, bhamssn.org. I'll put it in the chat later. Um, so yeah, uh, now we'll move on to our Q&A session. If, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll read them out one by one. Um, please keep your mics and video cameras turned off. So I think I'll kickstart the Q&A session, uh, unless you want to close your lab first, quickly, maybe. Uh, yeah, we can do. Do you want to, do you want to you know, tour around the lab? Let's go. Yeah. So this is going to be very awkward as I unplug my computer. Uh, can you see it right? Here we go. It's quite exciting. And of course, because all the lights are on timers and, and things, it goes, to, it goes to sleep. So this is what I was talking about. This is what we call a, a patch clamp rig. And we can see... This thing here is our little robot arm. It's quite difficult to uh, manipulate one's laptop. But that thing here is, is the set of preamplifier. And we put the little needle on the end. And then we, we stick it on this chamber that the brain slice lives in. And the microscope looks at the brain slice. And we make the recording from the brain slice that lives in the little chamber here. And we, it's a big old lab, actually. We've got lots and lots of different pieces of kit that do all different kinds of recording um, from the brains, depending on what information we want out of them. And this is the machine that makes our, our electrodes. It just pulls little bits of glass um, into, into the really sharp uh, electrodes that we're interested in. This is a brain slicer, literally. So it's like the world's poshest kind of meat slicer, you know, that you get at Sainsbury's to get your, your, your ham or whatever you're getting. And this has a little tiny vibrating blade that's made of the same kind of stuff that, that Formula One brakes are made of. And it cuts brains into tiny um, 400 micron slices and keeps them alive so uh, that, that we can make recordings from them. And we've got loads, you know, it's, it's, you know, no one's here, obviously. But basically, yeah, we've got this huge lab full of lots and lots of these recording systems. And ordinarily, it would be full of people and we'd be constantly making recordings of things. So you can see that it's actually quite, you know, it's a complicated piece of, there's lots and lots of amplifiers and filters and digitizers and things like that, that are attached to uh, the needles that we poke in the brain. And that's how we figure out what goes on. That's how we understand the, uh, the systems that we've got um, in front of us. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Right, put myself back in. Thank you very much. That was quite exciting. Um, so yeah, we have a few questions in the chat already. Yes, I can see them. Do you want me to read them out one by one? If you'd like, or do you prefer me to read them out? Well, I'll do it. Don't worry. I could, okay. um, I'm going to start with, uh, can we see the lab yet? Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Right. Ibrahim, what's more needed to become a neuroscientist, physics or chemistry? Very good question. Uh, I would say, I mean, technically here at Aston, you can do either or both. What we want in terms of uh, getting onto the course is one or two of what we call the core sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, or maths. If you've got one of them and you're good at it, we can get you the rest of the way because the, the physics and the chemistry proves that you've got that scientific understanding. Obviously, there's no A-level in neuroscience that would be daft. Um, but as, as long as you can bring that kind of that passion for science and that basic understanding of how the scientific method works, we can fill your brain up with all the things you need to know 
in order to be a neuroscientist. Does the brain get ever too big for the skull? Says Davin, and uh, it's been answered already. Yes, Abdullah. If you drink too much water, the brain swells up and it can push through uh, against the skull. That's absolutely correct. So the brain can, and that's part of what happens if you are in an accident or you have meningitis or you've got various conditions that make your brain inflamed is it starts to push against the skull because your skull is obviously very hard and your brain is very soft. And what happens is that the, the base of the brain starts to get pushed against the base of the skull. And that's when you're in real trouble because the very base of the brain, as you may well know, contains all the stuff that kind of uh, automatically keeps you alive, your heart rate, your breathing, all that kind of stuff. And so if it gets squashed too much, you will die because it will it will kill all the, the bits of your brain that keep your heart beating and keep all the, the stuff that you don't think about uh, going. So what will happen is if, you know, heaven forbid, you were to get in an accident, um, the, the surgeon, if it's, if it's uh, a serious enough problem, will, will actually remove part of your skull and let your brain swell out the top until it feels better and then you put your skull back together. So it's, it's kind of like a pressure release valve. Um, so yeah, the brain often gets too big for the skull. It's, it's a medical emergency. Uh, thank you, Anita. It's been a pleasure. Um, listen to the brain. What do I mean by listening to the brain? It's an easy way to say it, but it can cause a bit of uh, confusion. What I mean is that we are recording the electrical signals that the, those brain cells, those brain networks are producing, and, and they are effectively waves, you know, much like sound or anything else. And in some cases, out in the lab, some of those bits of equipment are in fact sound transducers. So we listen, we literally listen to what the brain's doing so we can react, because you can react quicker to what you're listening to than, than what you can see. Um, so the listening is the, the understanding and the recording of these intimate electrical signals. How do you think neuroscience will help in the development of society for the future? I think it will help us understand better differences between each other and understand that, you know, we're all kind of the same and our brains are all different, but we're all wanting to do the same thing. I think there's a great societal benefit for more understanding of neuroscience because it shows us that even though our brains are all different and uniquely wired, that they're still unique and wonderful and beautiful in and of themselves, whatever it is, however it's wired. Um, we know that our brains are complicated and we know that they are different from each other. And the more that we understand that little differences add up to big changes, the better we'll understand each other. And hopefully what we'll do is help people live better. The reason I'm in neuroscience is because I want to live, help people live better for longer. I want to, you know, have, have a, a greater quality of life throughout our lifetime, if you see what I mean. Yeah, so um, get... yeah. Um, what would the ethical implications be for an increased understanding and knowledge of the brain? I think it depends how, how evil you are, really. <laughs> because obviously, um, and we're getting to things like that in, in stuff like uh, neural law, I mentioned. So people are saying that if I record from your brain, oh, I can find a signal that you're a psychopath or I can find you you telling the truth or not. And I think that you, well, like anything else, you know, like the invention of uh, gunpowder was actually supposed to help people do mining and it actually helped people uh, blow each other up. You have to be careful with what you've made. We have to be ethical about everything we do and of course because we're people and people are different from each other some people will be more ethical than others but as long as we've got an understanding of the science and i think that's where the politics and, and the, the kind of you know geopolitical stuff needs to come in as long as we understand what we can do we can help people make decisions to use that knowledge and use that power if you like more judiciously yeah um, we get to point such development in neuroscience that we can learn to rule over influence people. Yeah, exactly. The same kind of thing, you know, it is, is, is the case. If we get too good at it, it has the, um, the potential for misuse. And we've just got to, you know, we, the more we understand about what we can do, the better we can use it for good. This is my, uh, my take on it. Is it possible for epilepsy to simply go away or get cured? It depends. I am not a doc, a medical doctor, so I'm, you know, couch that in, in very specific terms. But it depends on what kind of epilepsy you've got. Some epilepsies will disappear with age. Some epilepsies are um, not necessarily cured, but treated. And lots of people go through life uh, taking anti-epileptic drugs and never having another epileptic seizure ever again, as long as they've they've found the right combination of drugs. 
Since neurons transmit information by electrical signals, how are memories stored? Ah, now there's the question. Um, it would appear, and, and we're still figuring this out, it would appear that memories are stored by kind of patterns of information in your brain. There are neurons that respond to specific people. You can have grandmother cells, you can have Jennifer Aniston cells, people who recorded the activity of a neuron to a particular phenomenon. But it would appear that memories per se are multiple kind of um, network activity of a bunch of neurons all talking together. And the trick is, often your memories are made on the fly. So if I think about my fifth birthday party, my fifth birthday party was at my grandma's house um, and I had a, a cake that looked like Slimer for the Ghostbusters, you know, that green ghost that's in the Ghostbusters because I loved Ghostbusters when I was a kid. Um, and I had my friends there, my family and, and whatnot. I don't have a video recording of that in my brain, but I do have an idea of what my grandma's house looked like and my grandma and my dad and my mum and my brothers and whatnot. And when, you, when I remember it, it kind of, it's a bit more like a computer game than a film. You've got these characters that, that obey these rules that you've made in your head and you synthesize those memories from scratch every time, which is why they can kind of drift. You can start to misremember things. Uh, do I need maths for A-levels if I want to become a neurosurgeon? It depends what the, on the medical school of your choice. You have to look very carefully. So to be a neurosurgeon, you have to be a medic. And to get, get into medical school, you have to look very carefully at the A-levels that that particular medical school requires. Usually, it's uh, chemistry and biology that they place an emphasis on, but it varies from medical school to medical school. So just go to the website and have a look. Uh, do I work with neurosurgeons? Yes, we, we do a lot of work with a lot of neurosurgeons, both in the, the children's hospital and across Europe. Uh, and it varies who it is. You know, we, we, we talk to lots of different ones. We've got this big wide network of, of things. How much does neuroscience school cost? Same as any other degree in uh, England, if you do it in England, uh, £9,250 a year. But of course, you get a loan. Uh, do you recommend studying neuroscience at university before medical school? So getting into postgraduate medicine is difficult. Some would say it's actually more difficult than getting into undergraduate medical school. But if you wanted to do a first degree to try and get you to do uh, into postgraduate medicine, then neuroscience or pharmacology are really good ones to, to pack. They'll, they'll give you all the grounding that you need. How many nerve cells in just a fingertip? Um, that depends what you count as nerve cells. So in your fingertip, you've got uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of these proprioceptors, um, Merkel's discs and Ruffini endings and all that kind of stuff that, that lives in the skin. But in, in terms of nerve cells, it's usually more actually nerve endings that transmit it to, you know, large, very long um, one or two cells that make way up to your spinal cord and then talk to the whole bunch of cells in your brain. Are there more jobs for neuroscientists in education or tech companies like DeepMind? There's lots of jobs in education. DeepMind and, and, and AI companies like them love to hire neuroscientists because the neuroscientists do neuroscience on the artificial intelligence that companies like DeepMind and other such people make because it's very difficult to figure out what's happened in an artificial intelligence system. So sometimes they hire people with a neuroscience background to effectively do neuroscience on the computer itself. What are the effects of the PTSD in the brain? That is very complicated and probably a bit too um, deep to go into in the few minutes that we've got, but it comes down to uh, humans are programmed effectively to reinforce memories. And we are especially programmed to reinforce difficult memories. If you think about when we were evolving, when we were sort of cavemen, um, you wanted to survive. And so if you thought that the saber toothed tiger was over there, uh, uh, or you, if you ate those berries, it would make you very ill. You remember those really, really bad things that have happened to you more than the nice things because you want to live. And so you remember sort of running away from the saber-toothed tiger, or taking the berries that made you very ill, much, much better because that's more survive, you know, that's, that's evolutionarily more uh, beneficial. So the humans, unfortunately, are wired to remember nasty things much better than we are to remember nice things. Um, thanks, Janet. Uh, thanks, folks. Strong neuroelectric could help your brain kind of makes memories it goes guessing what you could have felt stuff like that. So the best the, what I'll leave you is um, oh I'll, I'll touch, the gag reflex yeah it's another kind of evolutionary thing. Our, our vomiting centers are actually down in the bit of the brain that's all automatic down here, um, and it's to, it's literally yeah it's it's almost a reflex action to stop you from eating something that's going to make you ill. 
Uh, we use all of our brain, all of it. We just don't use all of it at once. Each bit of it is dedicated to a different function. Um, where are we going? Uh, what I'll leave you with, right? And I'm going to leave you uh, and, and let you on with the rest of your evening. A lot of you are going to do your A-levels, a lot of your A-level students, and, and you're going to do your exams. Um, the best tip I can give you is to get a good night's sleep because our memories are formed and information is stored through the day. And then when we sleep, it's a bit like, you know, those old school films cameras that you'd have to take to Boots or whatever and get it developed. Um, we make the negatives, we take the photos during the day. And then when we sleep, the memories are kind of implanted and, and consolidated in our brain by the process of sleeping. That's one of the reasons why we sleep. And they've done lots of experiments of running rats through mazes and, and looking at the different cells that correspond to the area that they're running through. And those rats will dream that maze backwards over and over and over very quickly through their sleep to consolidate the information. So that's how, um, that's how mem one of the ways that memories are formed. So if you're going to revise, revise a little bit and revise often. And when you finish revising, get yourself a really, really good night's sleep. Um, Ishan, I'm going to do one more and I'm going to go psychology A-level for our neuroscience course. We don't uh, count it as a core science, so you can take it or not. Um, it's up to you. Just follow your, follow your passion, basically. Okay. Sorry, I, um, I had a really... few Sorry, questions Karen. myself, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, how does epilepsy lead to so-called religious experiences? Ah, now that depends where your epilepsy is. So there are parts of your brain that make you feel more religious than others, like the temporal lobe, for example. And so one of the auras that people experience before they have a, a seizure, some people smell burnt toast and some people feel as, as if they are, they are feeling very religious. Um, and it, it just depends on, on which bit is, uh, is active at the time, but it tends to be done in the temporal lobe. Yeah. Uh, who's your favorite neuroscientist? It's a very good question. Um, I'm going to say, well, apart from my mate Gav, who's my mentor and lovely and lives in the office next door and he's not here, so he can't hear me, so I can say that. Um, I would say uh, a fella called Bart Sackman, who invented in the 80s the technique that I use every day. So I couldn't do what I do without Bart Sackman and Erwin Nayer, who won the Nobel Prize way back in the 80s for the invention of patch clamp. What's the biggest breakthrough in neuroscience of all time? In your opinion, I would say it would be Hodgkin and Huxley and J.Z. Young back in the mid 20th century, figuring out how the action potential works, how the how the the, the protein channels work together to, to to make an action potential to make our neurons talk to each other. Um, what does a normal working day look like as a researcher and how many days a week do you work? Uh, seven is the answer. Academia is more than a full-time job, unfortunately. It depends. It, it, there's no set working day. I might be helping my engineer friends print nanomaterials. I might be teaching a massive lab full of undergraduate students. I might be sitting applying to the government for a multi-million pound grant or writing a paper or giving a talk to, to a bunch of guys um, for, for sort of outreach purposes. They're lit literally, and I mean this, no day is the same. No two days are the same. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Um, um, Agarloon, I've got one more. Is undergrad good enough for a neuroscience job or do you have to do, have a PhD? You don't have to have a PhD. It depends what kind of neuroscience job you want. You can go and do perfectly well with an undergraduate degree or you can do a PhD. I think that's the last question. So thank you very I much, Doctor, not. for joining. Um, that was an amazing talk. I was I was quite interested. Um, an amazing Q&A session as well. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining as well. Thanks for all your questions. It was really good, really good questions, I have to say. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I hope to see you soon. Aston, if you want to come and come and visit us on a, a, a open day or whatever, we're, we're always here and they're advertised on the website or on the back of a bus or wherever they do these things. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in neuroscience, it's a great thing to do. Okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Cheers, guys. Have a good night. Take care of yourselves.